Module 6, Monitoring and Evaluation. Monitoring and evaluation is often overlooked, and this session will discuss why this task is so important. Case studies will be provided to illustrate this and what can go wrong when this activity is not completed adequately. Some of the basic data requirements for effective road safety management will be discussed, linking back to the earlier discussion points on an effective road safety data strategy. Basic guidance will also be provided on the methods used in the evaluation of effective road safety outcomes. Dr. Turner will start Module 6. About why we do this and about the methods that we actually use. And as I said to you yesterday and again earlier today, this is often forgotten. It's often thought of as the last process, but it is one of the most important processes. If we don't understand what we are doing, then we may be spending money in the wrong way. We may be putting money into the wrong thing. And as I will show you shortly, there is an example where we can even make road safety worse. We think we're doing a good thing, but actually we are doing a bad thing. And that is why this is so important. Firstly, we'll talk about the importance of this issue. Secondly, we'll talk about some of the data requirements. What information do we need? And then thirdly, methods for evaluation. And because this is such a complex area, I've also got some relevant resources, the references, uh, other information where you can find out more details on this. So definitions first of all. What do we mean by monitoring? And this is the official definition from the, the guide. This is the systematic collection of data regarding the performance of a road safety program or intervention during or after its implementation. It's very confusing. It means we collect data in a thorough way, a systematic way. It's not choosing this and this, it's we do this process. And we want to know about how the road safety program, so all of our activities, or maybe a single intervention, is actually doing after we put it in place. Is it making an improvement? No change, making things worse. We monitor and we watch. The second definition is evaluation, and this involves analysis. We analyse the data that we have collected, and we find out whether it has been effective or not. Okay, so firstly, monitoring is collection, and then there's the evaluation is the uh, actual analysis. We need to identify whether what we're doing is actually making any change. Again, everything is expensive. We have only small amounts of money. We need to make sure that what we're doing is having a benefit. But not only that, is it having a benefit better than something else we could spend our money on? If we choose to do enforcement for speed, is it better we have police out with cameras, with uh, lasers, uh, radars, or is it best we put in place uh, speed cameras? that are automatic speed cameras. Which is best? Which one should we spend our money on? And the only way we can tell this is through information gathered from our monitoring and evaluation. At the very first uh, module, we talked about this big, horrible triangle, the, the pyramid. It talked about interventions. We choose interventions. We need to measure that these interventions are really happening. Are they changing the behavior? Are they changing crash outcomes? Are they changing social costs? So we need to decide whether what we have spent our money on is actually having a change, ha having an effect. And we said we wanted to reduce crashes perhaps as part of a strategy by 30%. Has this happened? Have we done better? Or do we need to do more? Sometimes there are unwanted or unexpected effects. I've seen treatments go in place where we expected one thing to happen, but something different happens. I'll show you an example where this can be bad, but sometimes this, this can be good. In one case, we put in place on a roadway the wire rope barriers in the middle of the road that uh, Greg from IRAP showed you earlier. You remember the barrier? If you hit the barrier, no more head-on crashes. We also found out, though, that this reduced the number of people who drove off the side of the road as well. This is unexpected. Why would a barrier in the middle of the road stop people from driving off the side of the road? And the reason was because when people drive, sometimes they'll go over that middle centre line and they'll say, whoa, and they'll try and steer back and they'll lose control. So that treatment had an un unintended or unexpected outcome, which was good. 
Sometimes it'll be good, sometimes it might be bad. So we can do uh, surveys to establish that what we have put in place is uh, acceptable. What do they think about speed cameras? What do they think about us using wire rope barriers in the middle of the road? And so over time we can do these surveys one year, next year, next year. And we might find at the start people do not like speed cameras. But then we start a campaign and we say this is why we use speed cameras. This is for safety. And over time we see that people start to like speed cameras a little bit more. Is it changing? So we can establish from different measures the change over time. Back to these intermediate measures, such as speeds, we need to measure those things as well to see from our enforcement on speed, are the speeds of vehicles decreasing or are they the same? Do we need to do more? Why is it important? Well, the obvious answer is because we have limited funding. We all have limited funding. We need to make analysis to see that what we're doing is the most effective way to spend our money. And the only way we can do that is to monitor and evaluate what we are doing. To make sure that that limited funding is spent in the most effective way. There is no point wasting money on this if it doesn't work. We need to spend that money elsewhere. We need that money to make it a good impact. Again, we do need good information on the effectiveness of interventions. We need to know that what we're doing is working. We need to know, yes, speed cameras do work, or yes, wire rope barrier in the centre of the road is working. So some interventions may have little or no safety benefits. There are situations where road safety interventions actually have a bad impact on safety. You might think, how is this possible? How can we possibly have things we do for road safety that actually make crashes worse? Well, I'll give you one example. For many years in Australia and other countries in Europe, we used to do training, advanced driver training skid training. We get young adults into the car, drive fast, and then when, um, with these on the car we can lift the car up off the road slightly. And it means that there's more skidding. And so the idea was this is a way for young people to practice driving fast and then when a skid happens they can learn to control. They can say when you have a, a skid when you're driving normally this is what you do. So we used to train young people in this sort of a program. We used to spend money for children or for young adults trained. But what we found is that after they did this training, some of these courses, the risk got worse. These people who had been trained thought, now I have all the license I need to drive fast. I'm a, such a good driver now. Yes, it's true. This is true. And so they drove faster. And then when on the, the normal road, it meant that they had a higher chance of having a crash. Okay, so sometimes there are unintended consequences, and this is why we need to monitor and evaluate. Because if you get things wrong, you could make the situation worse, and we are all working so, so hard to make the situation better. Okay, so remember this example. There are others as well. Okay, so this one here is looking at uh, some of the uh, benefits from our infrastructure treatments. So in this case, we looked at, in Australia, all the treatments we had used for improving the road environment. So each of these rows talks about one type of treatment. The top there is roundabouts. We have signals. We have uh, barriers, warning signs. In the study, we collected the information years after these treatments had gone into place, after we installed the roundabout. And we found out something which worried us. We found for our fatal and serious crash outcomes, there was an improvement only at half of the sites that we had treated. At some of the sites, a quarter of our sites where we'd done black spot type studies, treatments, new infrastructure, safety was actually worse. Things had changed and were worse. Now this may be because what was put in place was wrong. It may be that because there was poor maintenance. Or it may be something more simple. It may be traffic volumes have increased. More cars usually means more crashes. It could be a combination, all of these things together. But it is important for us now in Australia, we are starting to do some research on the subject. What has happened here at these locations where safety has got worse? We have spent money, big amounts of money, at some of these locations, and the problem is getting worse. If it is because increases in cars, this is not such a, a big issue for us. If it is because the treatments 
are not effective, we need to change what we do. So we are monitoring and we are evaluating what we are doing. There are different types of evaluations that we do. We can do a process evaluation. And that's understanding about the process. What went right, what went wrong, in our communications with people, in our political elements, what didn't work, what did work. How did things go? How was the treatment delivered? Did things go to plan? Were the methods we used effective? When we installed those, those uh, speed cameras, was the process between the road agency and the police good? Was there problems in the back office, processing fines, sending out uh, letters for people to pay fines? So all of these issues that relate to how we put in place these, these new measures, how can the process be improved? So it's useful after something happens to discuss what could be done better next time. So this is one type of evaluation. The other type of evalu evaluation is the outcome. How effective was this new treatment or intervention for a roundabout? What was the percent reduction in crashes? For a speed policy, what was the change in speeds afterwards? So was there a change in crashes or a change in behaviour? Now we use this information more often because it helps us to answer the question, was this treatment worth it? Was the cost to put this in place? Was the cost actually more than the benefit? So that's, I'll discuss mainly the, uh, the outcome and evaluations. But I guess the point here, the bottom point, we use both of these things in evaluation for road safety. Again, just back to our old diagram. This one here, our data needs. We talk about what we do, the interventions. We measure what we've done, more speed cameras, more police hours on enforcement, more use of roundabouts. We talk about the intermediate measures. What were the changes in behaviour? Did speeds reduce? Are people now driving slower? What was the crash outcomes? What were the social outcomes, medical costs, these sorts of things? Now we need to monitor at programme level, so as an example, a national strategy. We may say we want to change crashes, reduce them by 50%. We need to monitor against We need to make sure that we are delivering the right things to give us the outcome that we need. So we need to monitor against a program level. But also we monitor at project level. So if we put in a roundabout, or we put in a speed camera, we need to monitor and evaluate that as well. And a point here that this process needs to be driven by a lead agency. Someone's got to take responsibility. Maybe some of the actions will be uh, evaluated by the police sometimes by hospital, sometimes by road agency. But we all need to agree who would be responsible. So at program level, so think about a national strategy. In the next 10 years, we want to reduce our crashes by 50%. This is what we will do. We will do all of these things. We need to list all of the activities we want to undertake. And we need to monitor and track our performance. And again, back to the diagram. This is exactly what this is about. That's why we collected information on how many speed cameras were put in place, how many hours enforcement we've done. That's why we need to collect this information about what is the speeds of our cars, what is the percentage of helmet wearing. This is why we collect crash data, because it tells us the, the overall outcomes. At project level, we also want to do evaluations. And how we do this depends on the type of project. So, for instance, we might put in a treatment on the road, a roundabout, or a wire rope barrier in the middle of the road. And we might, in that case, want to measure the number of crashes before and the number of crashes after. That is the difference. Has there been an improvement, or have things not improved? Different, though, for helmets. If you have a helmet-wearing uh, project, maybe enforcement or encouragement, uh, training, education as your program. Maybe we measure things like the helmet wearing uh, rate, maybe in children, before and after. Maybe before, only 20% 20 of, 20 of children going to school were wearing helmets. We conduct our training or education program. Afterwards, 80%. We think this is successful, this is good. There's been an increase. 
speed related to crashes. Before and after, a speed camera goes in place. We might collect the number of crashes before that relate to speed, put in the speed camera, and measure afterwards how many speed related crashes are happening now. If there's a decrease, we know this is a good thing, but how much? Just again, some of the issues to understand when you do this evaluation. There are issues relating to underreporting, which we've already discussed. There are different methods for evaluation. I'll explain what a control group is, and there are statistical techniques which I will not go into today. This is for a university. Today is just a quick uh, overview. But there are advice, there are resources, and there are networks available to help. And again, we mentioned ERTAD yesterday. This is one area they help in terms of their work. There are different ways we do evaluations. My key point in showing you this information is there are different ways. Some are better than others. Some ways, some techniques we use in evaluation give us the wrong result. They're not good enough. And the big concern we have is that this is the technique that is used most of the time. There are some better techniques which take more effort. They will give you okay results. And then there are very expensive techniques that will give you the best results, but they will cost you more money. So what do you choose? So I'll tell you which ones to choose in a moment. You may have never heard of this before, but this is what they do in hospitals. This is the gold standard in evaluation. This is what the medical doctors always want to present at conferences on. It's the best way to do things. I'll try and keep this simple. What we do is we, maybe it's a training program, maybe we're training children on how to be safe. What we do is we select 100 children, and out of those 100 children, we randomly select 50, half of them, to get training, randomly select 50 not to get training. That way, we know that these children are the same in every other element. They are the same age, they are matched exactly the same. The only difference between the groups is that they have one group has had training and one group not training. So we have information on both groups before and then after. All I'm going to say on this is this is the gold standard best method, but it is not used in road safety very often. Not even in my country. Not even in, uh, in Europe and not even in the US. There are some examples, but not many. And I'd suggest for you, maybe one day this might be useful, you might have a university who, who know how to do this, but it is not essential. I just want to tell you that this is the best one to use, though. I think my key point here is this is known as the best method. One day it may be useful. In my life, I've used this method only two times, and the total value of that work was $7 million for that research to understand using this technique, so it was expensive. So for that reason, I won't um, spend much more time talking on the details on this what I will tell you is more about the approach that is normally used and that is probably best for your country. What we would normally do is called a before and after with a control group experiment. This is the most common approach we use in road safety evaluation. Again, I know this is a complex issue. There is more detail in your notes where I've given some detail on this that you can go back to afterwards. There are a lot of research papers around on the subject, on evaluations. Uh, in Australia, we mostly use that simple approach before and after, at locations that have a change, compared to similar locations with no change. There is a new technique that I will not explain to you. It is very complex again. I want you to know the name, though. Empirical Bayes. This is now used in, in the US and in some countries. It is becoming a popular method for evaluation. I will not explain this to you now, but there is a reference in your notes to this. Okay, so I just want you to know that there are many, many methods. But for you, the most appropriate will be before and after with control. It's used very commonly in road safety evaluation all around the world still. But it provi provides only weak evidence. And the reason is, we cannot tell if the change before and after is because of what we have done or because of other things that have happened. Some of the changes may be due to external factors. Weather, change in traffic volumes, change in police enforcement, change in education, change in vehicles, safer vehicles. All these things impact on road safety. So if you do a study that is only looking at the location where there has been something changed, you will get maybe the wrong result. 
Okay, the bottom point I put in bold. If you use this without control, it may provide the wrong result. Another approach we use quite commonly is called interrupted time series. This is at the start, year number one through to year number 11. This shows the number of deaths by population. Deaths were increasing over time. This might be for um, one country or for one region. They decided to make a difference and they knew that the big problem was drink driving. So they, they basically started to introduce breathalyzers, testing, testing for breath alcohol. And overnight, straight away, decrease. Okay, so this can be a very useful measure for us to understand a change. But there is an issue with this as well. There are also other things happening at this time. There maybe was more speed cameras. There's maybe better cars and different things happening. Their total fatalities over the last, or well, the period of 10 years from 1999 to 2009. They were going up in their crashes every year. And then suddenly here, big decrease in crashes. Maybe at that stage they'd put in place some sort of safety treatment. It may have been breathalyzers or something. But that, if, that, if they had thought that this was what had changed and caused the Im improvement in safety, they would have been wrong. Because this is actually the year of the glo uh, global financial crisis. And so on the roads in the US, the number of vehicles dropped. And because less vehicles, less trucks, less young drivers, the number of crashes decreased. Okay, so that's what makes this, it is not a simple task to do evaluation. You need to consider these other issues that may be happening at the same time. Okay, so look for expertise to help you with this. It is something that you need to start to learn to understand. This is another complex one, a cross-sectional analysis. Often we compare roads um, of one type against roads of another type. And so we may do a, a study looking at all of our roads on our network that have what is called a sealed shoulder. See on the side of the road here, there is a space. What happens if vehicles are driving along the road and they were to go off the road slightly? If there is a sealed shoulder, this means that they can come back onto the road without having a major problem. In this case, if they went off the road, it would be rough and the car might spin out of control. Okay? So we think that this is safer than that. And so studies might be done to compare all roads on a network like this, what were the crash numbers, crash rates, against all roads that look like that, what were the crash rates. This technique is used a lot in road safety as well. But again, there are dangers. And that is that on roads of this type, they're probably also wider. They're probably also straighter. They're higher quality for other reasons as well. So we can't say that it was only this, this change here that is the difference. There may be other differences as well. Again, there are techniques to try and um, fix this problem, but they are quite complex. And again, we usually rely on universities or research institutes to help us with this, this evaluation. Do not be worried if you don't fully understand this. My key points are that there are many different techniques. Seek expertise to help you with evaluation. You need to understand this process. It seems a little tricky, but really it's not. People at university in their first year can learn this. It's not a complex uh, issue for most of the analysis we need to do. Sample size, this means the numbers. How many speed cameras have we put in place? If it's just one, we can't expect changes at just one location to tell us what is really going on. If we have speed cameras in 100 locations, we will have better information about the effect. Sources of information for evaluation. You know the answers. Crash data. Crash costs. There's been a few questions on crash costs in the last couple of days. For us to understand crash costs, you need to know the number of crashes, and then you need to times that, multiply it, by the value of statistical life. What is value of statistical life? This is the cost of a crash to our society. Again, this is quite complex. We also have other measures we've discussed before, intermediate outcomes, behavioural change, surveys. We can collect information on road and roadside assets. We have our output 
measures, number of hours of speed enforcement, population, traffic volumes, all of these things can be used for evaluation. This is another reason why we need to collect this data. Sometimes we have no crash data. Many times we have no crash data. So we use what are called proxy measures. These are measures that give us an idea about what the change in safety might be without needing to have the crash information. An example might be our intervention is about enforcement. Our proxy measure would be speed change. We don't need to know the change in speed related crashes to know we're having a benefit. We can instead measure the speeds instead. There are other techniques. Conflict analysis is another one which I will not explain. A range of different indicators and data we can use. Speed monitoring I've mentioned yesterday. Very useful. Maybe one time a year or two times a year we measure speeds. And over time we can see there's been a decrease in people who are speeding. This is very useful to know if our policies are working. We can measure things like seatbelt wearing rates. People in the front seat of a car. What percentage of people are wearing seatbelts? This is easy to do. We stand on the side of the road at maybe an intersection. When the car stops, we look in the window and we can write yes, no, yes, no. We can do these surveys before a campaign about seatbelt wearing and then after again and we can compare the difference. Uh, similarly, child restraints, helmet wearing rates. We could also measure things like how many roads have got an IRAP five star rating or four star rating? Ambulance response time rates. How quickly is it taking an ambulance to get to a crash? Is it more than one hour or less on average? These are all things that can be collected and used in evaluation. Roads and roadside data we've mentioned as part of the IRAP discussion. Again, when you have no crash data, this can be used to evaluate and monitor our performance. It can happen after just a short duration. We can make a change and we can measure the IRAP score before and after straight away. They've done an IRAP score star ratings, beforehand two star, after three star. In this location, improved the pavement surface, wider shoulder, and they installed these lines, ba bump ba bump ba bump If you're driving along over these lines, it tells you you are leaving the road and so you come back on again. These improvements change the star rating from two star to three star. So this is again another way to do evaluation, monitor and evaluate. You don't need crashes to do this evaluation. This is complex stuff, it's not easy. There are issues we need to be aware of that cause problems for evaluations. At locations, there may be a change in traffic volume. Any increase in the number of vehicles will mean that there is likely to be an increase in crashes. And so we may put in place a new measure, a speed camera or something, but if the traffic numbers increase, more and more cars, we'd expect more crashes to happen. That is why it is so important to also measure traffic volume information. We have other issues which cause problems. We have issues like crash migration. Sometimes when we put a, a, a treatment in, maybe we have a, an intersection and we say at this intersection you cannot any longer turn into the side road. People may then drive to the next intersection and turn there and the crashes may move to that location. So there are these issues that can happen. General trends, over time, vehicles improve, other changes, education gets better. The number of crashes may change over time. Sometimes we put in a, uh, an intervention, maybe a speed camera, but other things are happening as well. There may be an education program or other issues that have an impact on the crashes at this location. And this last one, again, very complicated. The information in your notes about this. Regression to mean. What does that mean? When we choose, if you remember the uh, discussion on identifying crash locations, we chose the locations that had high crash numbers, our worst locations. Sometimes crash numbers go up and down. And sometimes crash numbers are high in one year, and next year they'll go down. Back to the normal again. Often we choose locations to treat based on high crash numbers in one year only. If we do nothing, next year numbers will drop down anyway. This is called regression to mean. So this just shows that for different treatments we get different amounts of uh, regression to mean. 
But again, just to let you know that there are experts around to help you do analysis at universities or at research institutes. Okay, so just to remind you, this is a slide to say this is something that needs to be thought about in your country as well. Crash costing and economic analysis. We spoke about that we only have small amounts of resources, of money to spend. We need to make sure that what we do is giving us the best benefits for our small amount of money. The technique for this is called benefit cost analysis. Okay, this compares the cost of what you're doing against the benefits. It can compare the cost of one intervention or another, and we can choose this is going to be the best one for us because it is lower cost but higher benefit. Again, I'm not going to tell you how to do this. This is a technique that requires training. But just to make you aware, this is a technique that people need to use in road safety. This benefit cost analysis is really important for giving a business case for road safety. You need to say to your treasury, to your governments, that for every dollar we spend on road safety, we will save $10. If you go to the government, to your ministers and say this, they will be interested. Okay, so you need to perhaps understand this method, and I'll give you the references shortly of where the information is. When we do evaluation and monitoring, we need to report our outcomes. The reason for this is we want to tell other people in the world what worked and what didn't. We want to tell other people in our country what worked and what didn't. So there is a process there to make sure we produce a report. And this gives some information in your notes about what can be done. The World Health Organization has made a range of guidance documents available for free. In every one of these documents, there is a section about evaluation. It will tell you, if you do a helmets program, how do I evaluate this? It will give you that introduction that you need. For drinking and driving, there is a manual for this. That will tell you what you need to do for your monitoring and evaluation. For seat belts, for speed management, for pedestrian safety changes. There is information in all of these manuals about monitoring and evaluation. It will use those same words that I have used because I have taken information from those documents. Lastly, we have produced in the last uh, short while a detailed document on this issue, available for free from Austroads, from the Australian government. It is an introductory guide for evaluating effectiveness of road safety treatments. It is mainly about road infrastructure changes, but it covers all of these issues that you need to know about.